You guys are in for a letdown. <laughs> um, dude, I don't know how much I, uh, I, I don't know how much I missed this church until I heard Pat start to sing again. Good grief. Can we just give it up for these guys every single week? And I, I'll tell you something else. I was watching uh, the sermon last week. You played for like 42 minutes straight. <laughs> Did Eric miss a cue? He was supposed to give you the nod so that you're good? He, he was like, you can stay up here. And I was like, oh. Okay, so <laughs> I'm just going to practice for the next hour. <laughs> That's great. Um, thank you. I am so excited uh, to be here uh, with you guys. Uh, it's been a year since we've been able to hang out here at 704. I can tell you this, the lights that are coming from the side are so bright. I can't see a soul out there, so I'm just assuming that there are people uh, in the audience this morning. Uh, this was our home uh, for uh, the better part of three and a half years before we decided to make the move down to Wilmington. And um, it's, it's been quite a journey. Uh, I had an opportunity uh, to help with the start of this church. I, I remember meeting Thad. He was my neighbor uh, in the neighborhood. And um, we were uh, started out as Rock Harbor and uh, a satellite community from Rock Harbor. And then Thad called me. I was in the middle of Food Lion. And he called me and he said, hey, what do you think about us going like independent? I said, I think it's stupid. <laughs> Um, but let me call you back because I'm in line. Um, one thing led to another, and here's 704. Um, man, yeah, what a great journey this church has had. Uh, I, I, I was sitting at home, and um, Thad called me, and he said, hey, are you interested in coming back and, and preaching a sermon uh, in July? And I had a couple of questions. My first one was, how many people did you call before you got down the list to me? You know, I am in education, and so uh, a little inside baseball here about education. When we have to call a sub, we have a list. And you might not know it, but some people are at the top of the list. And then there are other people that we call and like, hey, can you be a body and make sure nobody dies? As long as we can do that, you're good. So where am I on the list? That was my first question. My second question is, Trudy Gallup, is she going to be there? Because if not, I'm out. I mean, oh, God. <laughs> As you sit right in the middle of the row, I love you, Trudy. I miss your face. I miss your smile. I miss you laughing at me, even when my jokes are dumb. So thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> we have made this move to Wilmington, and um, this has been quite a journey for us. We, uh, we had to make this decision because it was a great opportunity, but also it was a chance to move closer to our family. Uh, and so when we made this move, things have changed for me. Uh, you can probably tell I'm very hairy. I'm a mountain kind of person. Uh, even though I grew up close to Wilmington, I always wanted to live in the mountains. And so instead, we went in the opposite direction. Uh, I am trying to learn beach life. I have on shorts. This is a hard moment for me. <laughs> I'm wearing flip-flops. I had to make sure I trim my toenails. I mean, I'm, I'm working through it. Uh, the beach life has brought some, uh, some, some things that I didn't know I had. Something down deep in my soul, in my belly, it calls to me. I have something brand new. I have boat envy. Hey, I want a boat so bad. And my wife and I have been talking, and she's kind of starting to do this. But all of the boats we're talking about have paddles instead of, of motors. So, so it's not quite the same. Um, we have seen a lot of changes in our life. It seems like it, it, it really is only a year, but so much has happened. kind of want to give you an idea. Um, when we first moved here, I've got an example of what our family was. So I just want you to see this. This is our family when we first moved uh, to Indian Trail. And there's no sound. <laughs> this is real life. You will notice a lot less gray. <laughs> There's a lot more hair on top. And those two babies, man, they were getting after it. I think Vivian was about three months old. This is actually right before we moved here. Um, and so now we live in Wilmington. And so this uh, is kind of what our family looks like now. This is, it's been a change. So the first picture you're going to see uh, is 
my uh, son who went uh, on fish camp a couple of weeks ago, and that is a hammerhead shark that he caught off the coast of uh, Carolina Beach. Um, the, he uh, came in the day before that with a bucket of crabs. My wife's car still smells the same. Um, <laughs> caught some mackerel the day before that. He is a fisherman, and my, uh, my daughter, uh, Vivian, is getting ready to start kindergarten. Uh, she is a, uh, a water bug, and she likes to be at the beach as much as possible. Uh, we have seen uh, a lot of changes. We've seen transitions that have happened in our life. Uh, we've seen a, a big growth. I mean, these kids have uh, doubled in height. I don't know where they get that from. Um, and uh, seen some new chapters. Really have been able to experience uh, some remember when moments. Uh, in life, when we're talking about this as, as a group, we call these those core memories, those things that you take with you for the rest of your life, the things uh, that you can't help but think of between now uh, and then all of the amazing things that have happened in your life. You have these really, really big moments. Some call them core memories. Some people call these uh, flash freeze memories, things that are so important that you remember all the little, the, the minute details. Um, in some places in, in, in life, we have these core memories in historical context. A lot of people call those remember when moments. Uh, do you remember where you were when something happened? Um, for my, my grandparents, maybe your great-grandparents if you're a lot younger, um, that question is, do you remember where you were when Pearl Harbor happened? Uh, for the, the next generation, it was the JFK assassination. Um, some people think of the Challenger explosion. For me, when I was in college, 9-11 happened, and I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing. I remember hearing it on the radio and thinking, what kind of made-up story is this? And then realizing all of the real things. For the next generation, it's probably going to be, where were you when school closed for COVID? That's going to be that next core memory. Uh, in Union County, it was really weird because uh, we had like E. coli or Ebola. Something crazy happened to the water. And everybody was like, don't drink it, don't shower, don't brush your teeth for 48 hours. Let's just stink up the whole place. And apparently that was going to make it fine. And then we never went back to school. That whole year, we were just, just done. Um, thinking about some maybe li less significant memories um, I have this, uh, this crucial memory in 1995. My, um, my granddad was this huge Atlanta Braves fan. I mean, big time Atlanta Braves fan. And finally, the Atlanta Braves won the World Series. I remember where I was sitting on my couch when the 95 Braves actually won. I remember calling my granddad and saying, yeah, 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 we won. And he, typical dad joke fashion, was like, you woke me up for that. Um, I, it's just a, such a crucial memory for me, but man, I have one thing that sticks out growing up. I mean, this was one of the most important things in my childhood and one of the most important things that ever happened in the decade of the nineties. I remember where I was. I remember where I was sitting. I remember what I was doing when I found out about this. I remember the moment that Hulk Hogan turned into a bad guy. I mean, what happened? He was the, say your prayers and eat your vitamins. He was the wrestler that everybody loved. And then he came out in the new world order. Anybody in here that's 35 or 40 and remember this? This is a big deal for me. Nobody, y'all can pretend like you don't watch wrestling. Somebody's up there. Hallelujah, let's go. <laughs> Hollywood Hulk Hogan. I remember where I was. And actually, I remember this because when we, we were growing up, we didn't have a lot of money, and so I couldn't actually order pay-per-views. And so I had to find out what happened from kids on the bus. <laughs> and I'm sitting on the bus, and like, Hogan's a bad guy. I said, you're a liar, and I'll fight you right here <laughs> in this bus. And it turned out to be true, but I, re I remember how big of a deal that was. It's like, it's just finding out something that had completely changed my viewpoint in life. Um, we didn't do four minutes of family yet.
So we're going to do one right now. It's a, it's a really short one. But what is one of those core memories that you have in your life? What's something that has happened uh, that has just made you think, oh my gosh, I'm never going to forget this. I want you to take a couple of minutes and tell somebody a, a core memory that was created based on a life event that you had, something that comes right off the top of your head, something that happened to you and your family. We'll take two minutes instead of four. Uh, so today, what we're going to spend some time doing is talking about a story that's in the Bible that comes across as so vitally important that the people around it have to have had core memories, flash freeze memories that happened because of this story. We are going back to the book of Luke, which you guys have been in since January, and we're going to be in Luke chapter 9. Now, I've been told, and I was watching the last sermon, and people start yelling at this point, like, wild stuff happens here. So I, I saw a t-shirt up there. Somebody's got a shirt on this morning that says it. Bring out the book. Bring out the book. Man, let's go. That's great. I'm going to take that back to, uh, to my new church and see what they think about that. Uh, I've got to get me one of those shirts as well. That's pretty cool. So we're in Luke chapter 9. We're bringing out the book. We are starting in verse 10. I'm going to be reading out of the ESV. And if you don't have a Bible with you, there are some Bibles on these tables over here. Uh, and we've got some friends that can help you uh, take care of that. If you don't have one, just raise your hand and we'll make sure that you get a Bible. Uh, again, we're in Luke chapter 9, and we're going to be starting in verse 10, reading from the ESV. It says, on the return, excuse me, on their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. By the way, you can go back to uh, chapter 9, verse 1, where Jesus tells the disciples, the apostles, to go out and preach the word, heal the sick. Uh, and so they are returning. That's what they are returning from. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to him, you give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are going to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so. And he had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up 12 baskets of broken pieces. Let's pray over God's word this morning. God, I'm so thankful that we have an opportunity to hear a story that we've heard over and over and over again and look at it in a light that might be new. Look at it in a light that just reminds us of your power, of your authority, of your peace and your grace and your mercy and your ability all in one. God, please hide me so that despite my inadequacy, I'm not seen but instead, you are shown that the reflection from me is nothing but a mirror of you. Hide me behind your cross so that you are seen, God. Amen. You know, this is a story that you heard if you were in church at any point in your life, for any span, I almost guarantee you're going to hear this story. The feeding of the 5,000 is one of the most well-known memories, excuse me, uh, miracles. It's one of the most popular stories that you are going to find. Now, here's what I find fascinating about it, though. You look at the whole Bible, okay? You take this whole thing, 
My Bible is ESV. It's a smaller book, and it's about a 1,000 pages. In this Bible, there are 66 separate books. And in this Bible, this ESV version, there are over 757,000 words. There is a lot to say. There's miracle after miracle, hundreds of stories. But this one, this one is a little bit unique. This story is told four different times in the Bible. It is in the book of Luke where we're reading right now. You can also find it in John. You can find it in Mark. And you can find it in Matthew. Now, if we think about 757,000 words, that's a lot to say. There are so many different unique opportunities to get something from the Bible. Why was this story worthy of being told four separate and distinct times? Why is it that this story matters so much that the author said, I have to write about it, despite the fact that somebody else had already written it? They could have saved that space and written about something else. I mean, Jesus was alive for 33 years. There were a lot of things that happened. We don't know all of the things. We don't know all the ins and outs. We don't know everything that was said. Surely, they could have probably found something else to put there, but they decided, no, this story, these seven verses in Luke, are important enough to be counted in Matthew, Mark, and John. So why? That is the question we want to answer, answer today. We're going to try to answer it. In fact, I'm an educator, so I went with the essential question mode. The essential question for today is why does this story, this miracle, seem to be so important to the gospel authors? And any good preacher is going to put together three points, so guess what? I got you three points today. Three reasons that I believe this story is so important that it was worth putting in the Bible four different times. So my first point kind of gets right to it. I believe that the reason this was put into the Bible was because it gives us a behind-the-scenes look at the creation of a core memory. See, in all four of the, uh, the stories that we are talking about here today, all four times that this story is written, the, the gospel authors want to make sure that you see Jesus actually mapping out a miracle, actually kind of planning to do things piece by piece to set up something valuable for the people that are there. Uh, Luke is a physician. Uh, the author of this Bible, or excuse me, of this book of the Bible, he's not actually a disciple or an apostle. You don't see stories, a lot of stories, about what Luke was doing. You only really know him because he's the author of Luke and the book of Acts. And so uh, he's a physician. He could have just given us the play-by-play. -play. Jesus went to this place. He fed a bunch of people. Hallelujah, let's move on. But instead, he decided he wanted to take some time and show you the conversation that was happening and the ins and outs of what was happening between him and the disciples while the miracle was occurring. Now, I'm going to level up a little bit on Thad. Thad's been slipping, by the way. Y'all need to let him know. He's been slipping. I went back and I started watching. That man has not worn a flannel shirt since January. Now, what, what, what are y'all doing to him? He's got to get back to his roots. Find him a flannel shirt. Put it on him. I'm just, I'm just saying, I'm going to try to level up on that a little bit. Instead of just bringing you three points, I'm going to bring you three points in this one point, and then I'm going to bring it to three points total. Are you ready? So three reasons that I think that we get to have a behind-the-scenes look, and it all involves the disciples and what they were doing here. I'm leveling up just a little bit. Verse 10 and 11, it says, On their return, the apostles uh, told him all that they had done, and he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. And we already heard him say that it was a desolate place. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But what it's really trying to tell you is that these guys were tired. I mean, they just come back from doing all of this work. They had put in hours. They had put in the days. They had put in the effort to spread the news, and they've got to come back just exhausted. And so Jesus, being the leader that he is, decides rest is important. I'm going to take you away. We're going to come away, and we're going to go to a place that's kind of isolated. And let's sit, and let's rest, and let's just reset. But the people found out about it. And so suddenly, he's got a crowd of at least 5,000 people that are following him there. Now, most leaders would have said, hey, my people need a break. I need a break. 
I can't deal with this right now. Go away. We're in concert next week. Get your tickets at Ticketmaster and pop up there. I'm not going to do anything today. Jesus could have said that. The disciples could have said that. But instead, after realizing that there were a lot of people there, when the crowds learned that they followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now, at this point, Jesus is working. He is bringing the heat, so much so that he's preaching all day. And it gets to the end of the day, and this is where I want to pick up with the first reason why I believe behind the scenes is important here uh, in verse 12 and 13. Now, the day had begun to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find some, somewhere to go. Uh, for it's a desolate place. But he said to them, this is my first point. He said to them, you give them something to eat. Jesus intentionally brought these guys away. He's got his 12 with him. They're all together. He knows what they have on them. He knows what they packed. He knows there is not 5,000 cans of tuna lying around. But he tells the disciples, you, you give them something to eat. And the disciples are looking at him and they actually say, that we can't. We have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we were to go and buy food for all these people. That first point, the reason that he wants you to see behind the scenes is that he needs you to realize you can't do this by yourself. He knows that they can't feed people. He knows they certainly can't feed 5,000 people, but he tells them anyway, you give them something to eat just so they can realize, oh, doggone, I can't do this. The second part... In verse 14, after they say, we can't do it unless we're going to buy food for all these people. From there, the 5,000 people were there. And he says, have them sit down in groups of about 50. Can you imagine being a fly on the wall? There's 5,000 people. There's 12 of us. And Jesus says, go tell them to get into groups of 50. Now, how are you going to count off? One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine. I mean, you're going to get to 50 because somebody is going to mess up. Somebody's text not paying attention. You're going to say the wrong number. You had to start over. Somebody's going to say, but if it's 51, then my kid can come with me. And then you got a problem. I mean, there's a reason why lines are the way they are in Carowinds. You imagine putting people in groups of 50 at this point. They've got to be thinking, why does this matter? What difference does this make? I mean, through all of this, They've seen Jesus heal the sick, help the blind to see, miracle after miracle. He has raised people from the dead. They kind of already got it. Jesus is going to figure out a way to feed all of these people. So why does it matter that I put them in groups of 50? Why don't you just feed them? I think the reason is because Jesus wanted them to understand that you not only can't do it alone, but even the little acts of service matter. The small steps towards doing something that God wants you to do are important. And then the third part of this is that in verse 17, and they all, excuse me, verse 16, um, the, he, broke the, he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. The disciples were the ones that carried every single plate to 5,000 people. And I believe he wanted the disciples to do that because they were going to be the ones that were talking. They're handing out the food. They're getting the thank you. They're getting the conversation. They're learning whose name is what. They are learning all about the families. They are bringing the food to the people. They are actually the harbinger of the miracle. Jesus is behind the scenes. He's behind the curtain. He's breaking bread and making things happen. The disciples are the one that is delivering that miracle to the people. I think the reason why he wants us to see the behind the scenes here is because working a miracle is awesome. Watching Jesus work a miracle is absolutely incredible. But being the conduit for the miracle, that is amazing. Jesus did not call the disciples to sit down and watch him feed 5,000 people. He called the disciples to come with him to see this moment and to deliver that miracle to his people. Today, maybe the question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we doing a great job of helping to deliver a miracle to someone else? Even in the smallest capacity, being the person or people that are serving in this role, 
is one of the most amazing things that can happen to a Christian. And it brings me to my next point, the reason for this story's importance. Uh, I think point number two is that we are getting to see this story engaged from multiple perspectives. You see, how you write this story defines your witness. You know, in all four books of the Bible, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that tell this story, it's all basically the same, and then each one has a, a little nuance, a small factor that plays a big role in providing a little bit of context, but also providing a little bit more of a lesson. In this story, we've got some major players that we see throughout the Bible. We've got Jesus Christ, who is the son of the living God. We have 12 disciples who are a great reflection of us and who we are. We are bad at this, but we're also good at this. We are learning. We are constantly trying to help. We are failing. We are getting back up, and we are doing things over and over and over again, and the disciples are a great window into, an act, into acts of service for Christ. We've got a huge group of people that are in need. We're going to talk about those people in just a moment. Then we've got something else. Uh, I want you to turn real quick, if you can, over to John. It's one book over, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And we're going to be in John chapter 6. This is the feeding of the 5,000. And there are two verses that I want to put out uh, in front of you for John chapter 6. So again, this is from um, the ESV. <clears throat> It says another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. And then verse 9, it says, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? I want you to just think for a second about the roles that we've got here. We've got a young kid that's deciding to bring lunch got disciples, you've got people in need, you've got Jesus. All of these roles matter. In fact, if you take any of them away, this story probably doesn't make it into the Bible. This story is about things that are happening around Jesus and people that come together that make something happen by Jesus. Sometimes we are the people that are hungry. Sometimes we are the disciples that are bringing the absolute awesome miracle to others. And sometimes we are some random person playing what should seem like a really tiny role. Think about this kid. He's got half a loaf of marita bread. He's got a couple of fish. And he's, he might be, I don't know, he might be going to work. Maybe he's going to school. He's got his lunch pack. He's just hopping along. I don't know why this kid's walking like this, but all right. That's what happened to my feet. He's just walking along. He's he's just going on his merry way, and this random guy, Andrew, stops him and says, hey, what's in the bag? (laughs) And the kid's like, smelly fish. I got smelly fish today for lunch. He has a chance here. That's mine. This is my lunch. I packed this lunch. My mama made this lunch. You're not taking what my mama made for me. He could have just walked on his merry way. He could have said, man, I'd love to give you this, but there's 5,000 people. By the way, it says men. We might associate that with them bringing their families also, so there's no telling how many people we're talking here. He's got to be looking at all these people and it's like, man, my fish ain't going nowhere. Uh, My fish can feed you and you and you. You can have a piece of bread, but only a half a piece of bread. And that's it. He could have just said that his part is so small that it's insignificant and therefore doesn't need to happen. He could have said that his part in being a miracle helper is so insignificant, so minuscule, it doesn't matter. Instead, this young man decided, I'm going to give you what I got. Everything I have is right here. It's a couple of fish, it's a couple of pieces of bread, and you can have it all if it helps you, Jesus. Every single bit of this that can go to help, I want it to go to help. Hey, think about his mom. She's packing a lunch today for little Johnny that's going to school. 
has no clue that she has raised a young man with such kindness and respect and a servant heart that even at that age, he has decided, I'm going to give to help others. That's the role that that mom played. or Whoever packed his lunch, we don't know. Um, you saw the picture of my son at uh, fish camp with the, with the hammerhead shark. Before that, he came home with seven Spanish mackerel. He said, these long fish, they're kind of slender. Um, I worked with him to show him. How I, did, I grew up in the woods, so it was easy for me to show him how to fillet fish and, and let's set it aside. There's a great video of him that I didn't bring, I will not show you, of him in this robe trying to figure out how to open up a fish and my daughter screaming, that's his brains! <laughs> um, so we set all this fish aside. The other day, my wife, New York born and bred, fried fish. My house smelled glorious. And we had uh, this meal, and we sit it down at the table, and we go to pray, and we say, what do we say when we pray? We say, bless the hands that prepared it. And for the first time in his life, those hands were my son's. Oh, man. I've seen joy. I've seen happiness come from him when he gets great test scores and when he has a great fun day somewhere. I've never seen him so proud as him being the one that helped catch the fish that put the meal on the table for the first time. Oh, my gosh. And to, to some of us, my daughter, <laughs> it's just dinner. She didn't see it that way. In fact, she recalled the brain's comment, I'm like, I am not touching this. After a little bit, by the way, she did, we convinced her that it's just fish sticks. She tried it and she liked it. They all ate, everybody ate. Everybody. It was a good meal, wasn't it, Katie? It was awesome. For the first time, he had been one of the providers of that meal. And man, I'm telling you, I've never not just seen somebody so proud, but I was proud. Because he had done something. He was willing to do something. He was willing to reach out. He was willing to step out. He was willing to try something new. And through all of that provided, this young man decided, I'm going to give what I got. It ain't much. It's 5,000 people. And I'm going to give what I got. He decided that his act of service would make a difference. That brings me to my last point. Those people that needed a difference maker, those were the people that needed this story the most. You go back to this, it's kind of an interesting take uh, as, um, as Pat joins us up here on stage now. There were four gospels that were written that told the story of the feeding of the 5,000. In those four, if you go and you look at three of them, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all say the same thing. Matthew 14, 15 says, this is a desolate place and the day is now over. Mark 6, 35 says, this is a desolate place and the hour is late. Luke 9, 12 says, for we are in a desolate place. And I believe that part three says... The reason that this story mattered that most is because it shows God's willingness to go to the desolate place. Yeah, I wondered why with the God of the universe in human form able to go anywhere on the planet that he chooses, he decides to go to a place called Bethsaida. He decides to go to a place that probably doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. This is a desolate place. His people are tired. They have already shared the good news with everybody. Why did he choose to go to a place that's truly so bad that at least three of the authors took time to tell you how awful it is. I believe that the reason the word desolate comes up so many times is because he just wanted to make sure you knew 
that in your most desolate place, God will find you. I believe that you got this story in the Bible four different times because when you are at your hungriest, God will feed you. I believe that the reason this story matters, the reason this scripture is here, is because no matter the cost, no matter how tired they are, the servants of God work for his glory to feed those around them that need it most. I am curious today how many of us are in a desolate place this morning. How many of you are tired or hungry? You are spiritually burnt out. You are in a place that's so rough and so isolated that you can't find safe harbor. You can't find a safe place to, raise, to lay your head. You can't find a place to exist that is safe and comfortable. And now I wonder, have we given that place to God? Have we called out for God to come to our desolate place? We've all experienced times that are hard. And some of us are doing it right now, and some of you have an opportunity to help those that are in a desolate place. Some of us have an opportunity to be a conduit for a miracle that someone else has, that someone else needs. And so at this moment, I want to ask you to, to bow your head. There are um, some folks that have, have gathered here. If you need prayer, they are on the sides. I need you to ask God in this moment. Um, is there a desolate place in your heart that you need God to go to? Are you in a desperate, desolate time in your life that you need God to show up? Is there a moment that you've decided that God can't come here? God can see every part of my heart. He can do everything in the world, but he can't go there. I can let God do a miracle in every single part of my life, but God, that place is too desolate. That place is so bad that I don't want to report it to you. I don't want you to know about it. I'm going to keep it tucked away in the bottom of my darkest, darkest time, my darkest core memory. God, that's where that is. Today, Jesus Christ is telling you, I will run to the desolate place for you. I will fight off. I will heal. I will raise from the dead your own positive spiritual life that needs glory, that needs the honor that I can bestow upon it. All you have to do is call out. God, I've got a desolate place in my heart, and I need you to cover it. I need you to shed light on it. Father God, we have an amazing body here today, a group of people that are equipped and a group of people that also have sufferings. And today I just ask God, will you search our hearts for desolation? Will you heal us? Will you feed our hungry times? Will you Show up, show out, bring a hurricane upon us so that nothing else stands in our way. Do that for us, God, in your name.